Okay, thank you very much for joining the Financial History Network uh, seminar series. As you might have been alerted, the meeting is being recorded. If you don't want your participation to be recorded, please contact uh, any of the conveners or indeed the uh, email for the network, which is finhisnetwork at gmail.com. And uh, we will um, do our best to um, remove that from the video as we will be posting the results in YouTube. Um, now, uh, we have today with us um, uh, an excellent paper by a notable group of scholars. And uh, this paper is entitled, if I can find the first page, yes. Um, uh, Repurposing Institutions, Trust Officers and the Dutch Financial System, 1690s to the 2000s. And it's going to be uh, presented by one of the most notable financial historians of, of our time, Professor Jos Jonker from University of Amsterdam. Uh, just uh, read economics and social history at the Free University of Amsterdam. He worked as an editor of uh, Hugh and Kings in, in The Hague as a consultant. And then in 1997, and until recently, he moved to Utrecht University, uh, first as a research fellow, and then um, as a lecturer in economic and social uh, history. Uh, as I said, um, his research interests have yet and gradually widened from the 20th century banking to embrace business and financial history from the 16th century to present. Um, and indeed, you, um, if you are in this business, you must have come across one of uh, the works of Jost and Abe, or indeed the works of Jost and, and Abe. So we're really, really pleased to have uh, you guys today in the Financial History Network and having this paper that without um, spoiling the, the presentation. If you've read the paper, then you've realized that what they are really presenting to us is a picture and a tour de force, a long durée paper of the corporate governance in, in the Netherlands uh, from the 17th century until today with this uh, focused organization. So just thank you very much, uh, over to you. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention uh, that we're happy to take questions through the chat as we go along. And then uh, at the end, we will, either, we will either collect them and I will read them out, or we'll ask you to come forward and open your microphone to, to present them. So sorry, just over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Bernardo, for your generous introduction. I'll start the screen sharing now, uh, assuming that you can all see it. Indeed, this is work together with Abba de Jong, Elsa Royal and uh, Gerard de Westerhuis. Uh, and we came together from two ends, Abba, Elsa and Gerard are coming from the 20th century, thinking about what to do with those administration offices, which we note as of importance for corporate takeover defences. Uh, and they, we started talking and I said, oh, actually, that's something that goes back to the late 17th century. And that made us think about how to write about it uh, from a perspective of long term financial system evolution. Um, now. OK, so. Just uh, a, a broad question, no need to answer this one. What do the following have in common? Bono, Renault, Nissan, Stellantis, that's the combination of Fiat Chrysler, PSA, and Peugeot of France. Ingvar Kamprat, the IKEA founder, ABN AMRO, Dutch Bank, Yandex, a Russian internet uh, uh, provider, AB InBev, the Belgian, Brazilian, American uh, brewer, the biggest brewer in the world, Group Suisse, uh, French utilities companies, Milan, a US uh, pharmaceutical company. And the answer is they either have an administrative head office in the Netherlands or some form of stichting, a stichting being a foundation in the Netherlands, a foundation to optimize either worldwide revenue flows or to function as a takeover for uh, defense. And this is puzzling because why, why, uh, so this had just 
it made us question why why is this the case what what, what explains this um, so what made us question why why is it happening in the netherlands why does that belgian brazilian us uh, brewer not have stifting in belgium uh, brazil or uh, the us and that also made us think that what why do financial systems continue to differ from each other? And indeed, some people argue that they diverge rather than converge. That also made us wonder, why does the Netherlands have such specific anti-takeover defences that turn out to be popular with foreign multinational enterprises? And then the third question, uh, why is the Netherlands, the Delaware of Europe, i.e. Uh, very easy to set up uh, devices for tax optimization, optimization of fl the revenue flows around the world. So the contents of the paper are essentially what makes financial systems differ from each other than the claims uh, we have in the paper. We distinguish five phases in the evolution of these contraptions in the Netherlands, and then we come to a brief conclusion. So if we turn to the question, what makes financial systems differ from each other, there are essentially three schools of thought. First, there is the school that thinks, oh, it's culture that uh, makes all the difference between countries, the informal institutions that set one country's economic system apart from uh, another. The second school of thought is legal economics. Legal traditions shape financial systems and that makes them differ from each other. The broadest difference is the old La Porta et al. Uh, uh, and that, that, discussion, uh, that, 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 that put a position in its extreme to sort of uh, uh, take that uh, extreme view. And the third, of course, Eber Calamiris School, of, at least that summarizes that position. Uh, beautifully, it's the bargaining outcomes within financial systems, within, uh, uh, within countries that shapes their uh, financial system. Um, what our paper claims is essentially uh, there should be a fourth uh, view, a, view uh, a fourth perspective on what makes them differ, and that is North informal institutions, and we posit that our administration offices or uh, stichting in the foundations is such an institution that touch Dutch financial system that you can do quite so easily in other ones, easily available in other ones. And that is coming back to the first slide. Netherlands is the preferred base for foreign multinational headquarters, so be it car fa uh, factories be it the Russian internet giant or the, uh, or the brewer. In addition, uh, in addition, there are specific takeover defences in the Netherlands that lead to what was called a Dutch discount, i.e. it is so easy to provide a corporate takeover defence in the Netherlands that shares in Dutch uh, corporations tend to trade below similar uh, corporations quoted, say, in Belgium, France or Germany. And then there is that European uh, Delaware, the Netherlands is very high on the international tax evasion uh, index of uh, all kinds of uh, NGOs that uh, try and make such indexes. How and why? And that centers on a trick called certificates, administrative contours, those administrative offices that turn into Stichtingen and that in the end turn into BFIs or Bijzondere Financiële Instellingen, special financial institutions. That's the last phase of the evolution that we sketch in this paper. So what we claim is those trust offices, administrative contour, are a prime example of Northian institutional adaptation, a formal institution that adapts itself over time within the financial system, reacting with it to create new opportunities. And that, in our view, adds to the legal, economic, cultural or political economy explanations of financial systems differences. You can do things through those uh, trust offices in the Netherlands that you can't so easily do elsewhere.
And the present function is best understood as an evolution of a long history starting in the 1690s. That's the first phase in which a, a, a common trick uh, securitization of a particular financial claim led to stock substitution. So the first instance which, uh, of which we know is a loan to the Austrian Empire by an Amsterdam banker that he cuts up in small pieces to sell to uh, investors, i.e. that Ill illiquid claim of the loan to the Austrian Empire backed by Mercury uh, supplies from the Austrian of the Hungarian mines to Amsterdam. The banker securitized that and sold small parcels of that loan on to investors. In, in the last quarter of the 18th century, that trick turned into stock substitution. So one type of security uh, was turned into another one, and that one was sold to uh, investors. And that stock substitution is an interesting one. It's the basis of much later uh, techniques in the sense that it splits legal ownership of a particular uh, firm or a particular bond into, in, uh, it, it splits the economic rights and the legal rights. So the ownership from the economic rights. So what happens is that in the certificate, so stock substitution leads to a bundle of securities held by an administrative office. That administrative office issues certificates giving right to that bundle of securities and giving right to the income flow from those securities. But the ownership of what later are uh, mainly uh, shares remains with the original security, with the original share. So it's splitting off economic rights to a particular security and the legal ownership. That is something which is important to keep in mind. Then in the 19th century is the heyday of stock substitution, notably, for instance, in the last quarter of this 19th century uh, with the American railroads. So most American railroads issued in Amsterdam, and Amsterdam is the second uh, exchange of importance in Europe uh, for issuing uh, US railroad uh, securities, London of course being the first one, that mostly happens with that stock substitution technique. So the administrative office holds the bundle of the original US railroad shares, issued certificates giving right to those particular uh, shares uh, if you want it, but essentially it splits off the dividend rights from the legal ownership of that particular uh, US railroad. And the interesting side effect was that those administrative, administrative offices held uh, block votes in the reorganization of US railroads. So uh, having the ownership rights, i.e. the right to vote on uh, AGMs, made Dutch administrative, administrative offices uh, much more effective in defending uh, holders rights than the scattered ownership which is prevalent in, for instance, uh, London, but also prevalent in the US itself. Then uh, the third phase is the early part of the 20th century, the rise of certification, i.e. Dutch corporations issuing certificates holding rights to those original shares rather than uh, issuing shares directly to uh, investors. Then that turned into uh, the major way of uh, building take anti takeover defenses in the Netherlands in the and to the host and obvious reasons, the building uh, of defensive, uh, nearly all Dutch quoted companies have a defensive device, one uh, kind of another. Most of them have an administrative office uh, that does this trick uh, for them by that particular stock substitution way. So shares are issued to an administrative office. The office issues certificates holding the right to those shares to investors, but invest if in effect in that certificate, they only have the right to the dividend flow from those shares. The ownership, i.e. the vote on the AGM, uh, sits in the administrative office. The administ administrative office is passive in that it doesn't, uh, uh, essentially, uh, it doesn't do a lot with those votes. 
uh, except when called upon uh, for defence of Pfizer by the, the original corporation, uh, which is an effective way of uh, preventing foreign ta uh, hostile takeovers. That tied in in that third quarter of the 20th century with a general opinion in the Netherlands that stakeholders should have priority over shareholders. It's the Supreme Court opines over that, Parliament over, opines over that. The fact that shareholders were essentially prevented from exercising votes over companies uh, filed in with the general opinion of how a corporation should act in the general interest of stakeholders rather than the more uh, focused interest of shareholders. In that third quarter, so in phase four, it's also originally Administrative Comptor issued certificates for all kinds of corporations at the same time. So they had a sort of a whole range of companies for which they did certificates. But in that last, in that phase four, Administrative Comptor tended to become tied to a, a one particular corporation with a sort of, uh, with the effect that the managers of the Administrative Comptor were also the managers of the corporation uh, concerned. And also, originally, until the 1950s, certificates used to be redeemable, i.e. if you were a shareholder, you had a certificate. If you wanted to vote on the AGM, you handed in your certificate to the administrative office and in exchange you would get the original shares if you had a vote. But increasingly, to bolster their takeover defences, uh, co corporations would issue certificates that were no longer redeemable, i.e. cutting off the shareholders from the vote entirely. And this was enshrined in uh, a national law in 1971 uh, that enshrined the stakeholders as preeminent in corporations and sidelined shareholders uh, by and by. And this is still apart from a brief interlude in which uh, uh, shareholder interests were uh, raised to the fore. The recent tendencies are that, again, even uh, the government supports the idea that stakeholders are more important with their shareholders. So when ABN EMRO, the Dutch leading bank, was uh, uh, taken into uh, public ownership following the collapse of the, uh, the takeover by three uh, banks uh, and the collapse of Fortis, uh, when it was resold sold back to the public uh, in uh, 2015, that was done in the form of certificates, the shares being held by an administrative contour tied to, uh, uh, to the bank. Uh, similarly, Carlos Slim, when he tried to take over Dutch telecoms company uh, KPN a couple of years ago in 2017, uh, the Stichting KPN, i.e. an administrative office, uh, blocked uh, the, the, his attempt by threatening to issue preference shares with special votes. Uh, so this is very much an alive uh, construction of the live device. Similarly, to the surprise of Wall Street Journal uh, at about the same time, 2015, when the US uh, uh, pharmaceutical company Milan was threatened by takeover, uh, they set up a Dutch thing, uh, which was of course unheard of in the, uh, in the US, no one knew what the thing was. Uh, it set up an administrative office with the same right as the KPN office, i.e. a right to issue, when called upon by the company concerned, issued uh, preference votes, uh, preference shares with a particular vote, uh, so that any takeover attempt could be blocked. Uh, that's also uh, the function of the AB in myth uh, stifting in the Netherlands. It holds 41% of uh, the, corpora the, uh, the corporate shares. It's a stifting based in Amsterdam. Uh, it holds 40% of the votes of uh, the Belgian, Brazilian, uh, US brewing giant, uh, effectively uh, uh, blocking any takeover of the company. And that is part and parcel of what happens in phase five, the new directions. So the administrative, uh, administrative control was originally a, a limited liability company with all the uh, the trappings attached to the limited liability companies, but uh, bankers and lawyers discovered that you, there's no reason to do it as a limited liability company. You could do it as a stifting, a foundation, uh, and that's more practical because uh, limited liability companies have all kinds of legal uh, duties to report things. Stiftings don't have a, a duty 
Stichting Report anything at all. So you can do whatever you like in a Stichting, no one uh, is ever, will ever be aware of it. Uh, but also Stichtings are far cheaper to run, uh, and far cheaper to set up on limited liability uh, companies. Uh, also, Stichting, you can arm them uh, with cheaper defensive devices, such as the emergency prefs with special votes that were uh, used in the case of KPN, the Dutch telecoms uh, giant, and Milan, but also uh, as, uh, as recent as last summer, uh, the, the French utility company Suez uh, set up a stichting with the same uh, purpose and with the same type of defense uh, as uh, Milan and uh, KPN did. Uh, as I said, there was a brief uh, shareholder power resurgence uh, uh, in the 1990s, uh, but it lost the game uh, following the uh, financial crisis in 2008. Uh, the, the Dutch postal services, for instance, blocked a takeover attempts by the Belgian Post uh, with again uh, the same the form of stichting uh, to, to prevent it. But the most uh, uh, an equally interesting, or perhaps even more interesting, new direction in the last quarter of the 20th uh, uh, century uh, is, it, is the Delaware uh, one. In 1982, as far as we are aware, there was a first Stichting Administratie Kantoor, which uh, held ownership rights, uh, royalty rights uh, of the IKEA uh, group, set up by Ingvar, Kantrap, uh, Ingvar Kamprat to secure uh, ownership of uh, his sprawling empire, but also uh, royalties and IP, uh, intellectual property rights uh, are uh, set up, are, are vested in a string of administratie kantoren uh, based in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, in 2002, the most recent one uh, estimate we have, the number of such stichting administratie kantoren, there was a law in 1994 uh, and, uh, which uh, uh, defined them as those bijzondere financiële instellingen, special financial institutions. Uh, the number was more than 12,000, so they must have grown since uh, the last 20 years, with a gr gross income flow of a staggering 3.6 trillion euros. Uh, uh, that's eight times Dutch GDP. Uh, so that's not a trivial matter. And again, those stichting administratie kantoren, those uh, special financial institutions, there is a direct line from those to what happened in the 1690s. And the interesting part of it, they are, uh, for one, as I say, uh, Stichting and are, in, are hardly visible. The Dutch Central Bank is supposed to supervise them, but there's, they have no uh, legal duty to publish anything uh, at all. And even though the, the rates, uh, the tax rates imposed on them are very low, if there are a lot of them, uh, that still generates uh, 1 billion euros of tax uh, and half a billion in financial and legal service fees. Thank you very much. So this is a marvelous way, uh, a little wheeze for uh, the Netherlands to make some income uh, on international uh, revenue flows centered in the Netherlands. And that is backed up uh, by the fact that the Netherlands from the 1960s onwards uh, purposefully built uh, a, a large network uh, of uh, bilateral uh, tax treaties with all kinds of countries, uh, under which, which means that they, these are tied to those uh, uh, special financial institutions. Uh, that's why they benefit from low tax rates on uh, international revenue flows for companies like, well, you name it. Uh, and this is the, the fact that most of those uh, are based on either tax advantages through that tax network, those bilateral treaties or a stock substitution that ties that special financial institution back to the negotiatie, uh, harking back to the, 19, the 1690s. So conclusions, the negotiatie, i.e. the trick, the, 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 the technique on which those administratie kantoren are based makes a Dutch system different since 1695. Uh, it's the perfect And interesting thing is that it's continuously a corporate lawyer in the Netherlands will know how to do it. It's low cost, uh, it's well known, the uh, legal situation is well known, 
it is uh, what makes it easier to do in the Netherlands than it would be in any other country. And that is because it's so deeply rooted for since essentially 300 years in a Dutch financial system, which may, sets the Netherlands apart from other countries because it creates solutions other systems cannot so easily or so cheaply uh, provide, which means that helps us understand an institution like this, and there must be other ones in other countries, uh, why continuing financial systems continue to diverge rather than converge on a single model. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jost, for sticking to the time and for this excellent presentation. I think that um, it has put the paper in a slightly different different light, at least from my reading of it. Um, we we haven't had questions in the in the uh, chat just yet, so I'll I'll take uh, my, the privilege as um as um chair to kick off the the with the questions. Um, just a, a small comment that we lost you there a couple of times, and it it coincided when you both spoke about this Northian institution and why you're pitching the paper to have this this uh, North angle to corporate governance. So I don't know if you want to uh, repeat that briefly. Uh, yes, well, so there are three schools of thought why financial systems differ from each other. Uh, the cultural dimension, i.e. it's informal institutions, the legal tradition, uh, essentially the, the old Laporta uh, et al. Uh, difference between code law countries uh, and common law countries. Uh, and, uh, there's a, uh, and, the, and then the, there's the political economy approach. But these three approaches overlook the fact that it's also formal institutions a formal institution like a trust office and the way that develops that sets apart financial systems from each other uh, and this is why we pitch it in that northian formal institutions direction because that helps us understand that for instance the way stock exchanges still work differently from one country to another that's also why a formal institution differs that's not necessarily that that view doesn't necessarily fit into the other three approaches of why financial systems continue to differ and in our view having a formal institution like those trust offices is another explanation and we should okay. uh, we, we should look more to formal institutions setting countries apart uh, in addition to uh, looking for legal tradition cultural differences or political economy outcomes Okay, very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, a small comment on the, another small comment or, or a co small comment on the paper is that somewhere um, you might want to, to have a reflection as to why these this archives of trust offices are able to survive for so long. I think that this is a little bit on the, um, as, as we, I mean, business historians have um, have uh, engaged with broader broader constituencies and have other people coming here. You know, this thing of reflecting a little bit as to why certain archives live uh, during that time is is um, is something. You know, the work of uh, Stephanie Decker. But that's a, that's just a minor thing. Really, the the, the comment or the question was that uh, this institution is really putting a premium on managerialism or, or that can be one, one criticism of the institution because it's basically not allowing uh, share, it's completely, completely disenfranchising the shareholders from having any, uh, or, or it's institutionalizing that divide of the shareholders having no say in the running of the company. So it's really the, the managers who are making all of the decisions as long as they are providing uh, appropriate returns, but even then they, they might not necessarily be, um, you know, removed. Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, you're quite correct in uh, putting it that way. Uh, however, this is something which happened, which becomes important for one only in the second half of the 20th century. Before that, uh, the, those trust officers are neutral in the way they do it. 
Uh, secondly, it's only one of the development strands in those trust offices, in the sense that from the 1980s, that second strand in the special financial institutions uh, helping uh, multinational corporations optimize tax flows uh, becomes a second very important strand and arguably, notably in the amount of money that uh, goes into them, uh, more important than the anti-takeover devices. So from, nine, from the 1980s, uh, those trust offices have two, four, two different, sprout two different branches which we can directly turn back to that long evolution as recognizably similar in, the, in what they do, but it's for a different purpose, i.e. tax optimization, uh, protecting royalties uh, or uh, from uh, uh, intellectual property. Uh, and, uh, but the, 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 the institution itself is recognized, recognizably the same and set up in a similar way. So from the 1980s, uh, rock groups, well, well, Bono was in the list, you may remember in the first slide. Uh, they tend, if they have an international or a global tour, they set up a stichting in Amsterdam that uh, centers the revenue flows. Uh, the, uh, film rights are very often channeled through one of the stichting in, uh, in Amsterdam of the, that held by a producer and set up for the purpose. So, uh, yes. Um, uh, um, it, 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 they, the Castellanos had a question. So, Sergio, if you can, sorry, sorry, did I interrupt you? Just uh, well, there was a pause. So, so yes, they emasculate shareholders uh, in yeah. exercising the vote, uh, but uh, in addition, there is another. Per they repurposed from the 1980s for t in a, in the recognizably the same form, but for uh, different kinds of purpose. Yeah, yes, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. So my, my question is along the lines of the purpose of the Financial History Network. We, we have um, scholars from, from all over the, the world, but particularly we aim to cater also for early career researchers. And here in, in your paper, you present a new category, say this Nordian tradition should be a category on, on its own. Uh, because it differentiates this Dutch financial system from others. So I was wondering what would you suggest or how do you see a future research agenda around this topic or particularly this new category that you're proposing in, in the paper for people here perhaps to join on this conversation? Well, well, well um, do correct me if I, forget, if I do not interpret in interpret your, uh, if, I, if I, do correct me if I misinterpret uh, your question. I understand it to, to ask that w whether I can do, make a suggestion of similar informal, uh, similar formal institutions in other financial systems. Yeah, or like, uh, where do you see like a res research agenda growing from this idea uh, of the Nordian tradition? <laughs> of the Dutch financial system. Well, the, the, the thing is, to, how do other financial systems solve that same problem? Uh, other financial systems will want uh, to have anti-takeover defenses, and most financial systems do, but they have a different form. And they do not necessarily lead to spin-offs like those special financial institutions I was talking about that have become so important from the 1980s. Uh, so if you want to analyze your financial system, do it from a functional perspective, uh, i.e. what do financial institutions do, and look how that financial system solved similar issues like anti-takeover defenses, but also tax optimization vehicles. They tend to be easier gained in some countries than in other ones. Does that answer your question correctly? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, yes. Thank you very much, Jost. Um, I don't know if we have another question from the 
public if everybody wants to raise their hand. No? Okay. Then uh, we'll, we'll continue with the... I, I see Paula wanting to go. Okay, Paula. Thank you very much, Paula. Hi, hello. Thank you so hello. much for this great presentation, great paper. Um, so I have a more um, a, a small question. It's more a curiosity about how these trust offices worked in the 19th century because uh, they, they kind of helped... Um, uh, the, as I understood, the Dutch market, market to absorb foreign securities as well, right? In a time of, uh, in, uh, in the face of uh, few information, not a lot of information about the securities, about the countries that issued them. But um, you gave the example of the railroads. I was wondering if they also dealt with uh, uh, sovereign government debt. If they dealt with, uh, I don't know, foreign uh, securities issued by Latin American governments, um, governments in Asia, uh, or even municipalities in the US, and uh, if they have a particular uh, practice about dealing with these kinds of uh, stock. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, they do deal with sovereign debt as well. Uh, there's a very big one dealing with Russian debt, for instance, already set up in the early uh, 19th century. To what extent they also deal in US municipalities or uh, Latin American debt, I'm not aware, I, I simply don't know, because we don't have a full overview of everything that uh, was run through an administrative contour. Uh, as a rule of thumb, you can say that if there was sufficient, if the loan was sufficiently large, there tended to be an administrative contour. And you will see it in the Amsterdam price current uh, because it's mentioned when it's a certificate or whether it's a bond or a share. Thank you so much. Uh, anybody else would like to uh, raise their hand? Well, well, anybody else comes forward. Um, I would like to ask, how is it that there, well, two, two things. One is, okay, sorry, uh, Gita Patel, I can always come back with mine. Gita Patel, if you can open your, your microphone, please. Hi, that was a, a really excellent, uh, fascinating paper, actually. I've, um, somebody from the, the Fed uh, in the US, uh, you know, I was talking to him about it, but and he's going to read it and actually get the Fed to talk about it, if you, if that's okay. Um, but I wanted to find out um, how the, uh, you know, what was what was the mechanism? What were the mechanisms for selling the certificates? I want uh, 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 well, in, the, in the in the I mean, starting with the late. Um, 17th century onwards. Uh, well, so, so the early loans are sold directly on the market by the bankers issuing the loan. So essentially they do not issue bonds, they issue certificates straight away. Uh, and that changes in the 19th century in the sense that sometimes administrative offices take the initiative to say, okay, there's a loan uh, somewhere or a banker takes the initiative, there's a, a big loan, say a US railroad uh, issues by the bonds or uh, shares. Uh, let's buy that, uh, let's buy into that loan or in that uh, issue of shares. They do that, they position that they, they essentially park those securities in an administrative office and have that issue, th that office issue certificates. And essentially, what uh, that that that, uh, that trust office sells them through uh, brokers or bankers. Ah, okay. I was wondering because of the, because um, I mean, I was curious because you know, looking at some of the the ways in which um, shares were sold in um, South Asia, right? Uh, both shares and and the equivalent of certificates. I mean, I think you made us really think in an interesting way, both about. Uh, what happens to, sh you know, what the, the division of labor, if you will, 
Um, and it's, it's that, that um, often it was word of mouth, right? Mm -hmm. It's still, and, and what's interesting to me is there are all sorts of things that are still done uh, in complicated forms of word of mouth, including, um, you know, sort of insur in forms of insurance, right? It's literally, mm -hmm. Uh, but and also somebody shows up at your door so I'm, I'm sort of curious i mean it's interesting like li literally you'll get somebody knocking at your door um and it's a broker and it's it's from everything from very very insurance for the largest forms of property in mumbai mm -hmm. to life insurance you know uh in in uh basically slums right mm -hmm. so i'm so I'm, that's why i was curious about it like what's what is we just assume that there are certain ways of selling. We assume things about a market, but that there are many ways that sort of sales happen. So I was, you know. Um, yes, I, I'm not aware of door-to-door -door selling you know, of securities was done in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do know is that the Amsterdam Stock Exchange uh, is almost overcrowded with brokers mm -hmm. and it's notably from the 1850s, uh, there is a network of brokers all over the country that would sell them through, uh, that, that would sell securities to anyone uh, wanting to buy them with a direct connection over through the tele, well, first by post and then the telegraph uh, through the MSM exchange. Uh, uh, it's a, a lovely suggestion that, that there may, be, may have been door to door selling. Until now, I haven't been aware of it. Mm, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gita. Um, anybody else would like to make a, a question at this point? If you want to raise your hand or open your microphone. Well, well, somebody else comes forward, then I might make another question to, to Joss. And you tell how between the 1985 and 1992, more or less, there is a big change of heart from the government. Mm -hmm. towards these institutions. I don't know if you can tell us a little bit more about how this, you know, if, if for so long they had allowed this institution to leave, why is it that they, they um, are no longer happy with it? Well, it is partly uh, because there, uh, there is the neoliberal tide that comes in the 1980s that emphasizes shareholder uh, value over stakeholder uh, interests uh, in the Netherlands. There is a, an academic discussion about that Dutch discount, i.e. Dutch companies being so well projected through uh, trust offices, but also through other devices that few foreign corporations are interested in taking them over. And there are one or two cases in which foreign takeovers are blocked. Uh, by uh, the trust office or another device. Uh, and also, finally, the, the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, uh, which had been a walkover uh, for the certification, uh, starts waking up to the importance of uh, supporting shareholder interests over stakeholder interests, uh, essentially because they think that will boost uh, their turnover as a market. Uh, that is uh, that, that that ties in with uh, an official commission, a government commission investigating uh, shareholder rights uh, in the Netherlands uh, that advocates uh, particular changes to legislation boosting shareholder uh, the, the importance of shareholder votes. Uh, people start worrying about the fact that AGMs are rarely. Uh, visited by shareholders or certificate holders why they haven't got the vote so why bother to turn up so there is a confluence of reasons why the government starts shifting its position in the 1980s and 90s uh, only for the government to sort of shoot back to its original position uh, in the early 20th, uh, 21st century uh, and essentially I, I suspect that that's how it's uh, how it will be uh, and essentially also that that form of uh, the importance of those takeover devices and uh, government's uh, support for it is, of course, essentially a form of economic chauvinism. Uh, we will decide ourselves whether we want to be yep. no, thank you very much. Um, we won't have foreign corporations do that for us. 
Thank you very much for that. I don't know if uh, Jan uh, Anert, if you had a question there. Jan? No. Okay. So, um, right. So if um, there are no longer any questions, then? Um, then we just, uh, then probably are left to um, invite you to our next uh, seminar, which will take place uh, on August 30th at the 11 a.m. Eastern uh, Standard Time. It's called Imported or Homegrown, the 1992-1993 EMS Crisis with Alan Naif from the Bank de France and Barry H. Green from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, please uh, do register. And uh, of course, uh, giving a big round of applause uh, to um, Jost, uh, Abe, uh, Riharda, and uh, Ray for their, for their paper. Uh, uh, and uh, we wish you really, really um, a lot of success with, with, with it. It's very, very interesting. And, and I hope uh, that um, it is also as warmly welcome as it has been in, the, in this community with the corporate governance people. Uh, I don't know if you've tried to present it with them. Yes, and the tax avoidance people, please. And the tax avoidance yeah. people, please. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much for, for the paper, Josie. It was really fascinating and, and, and for making the presentation so, so entertaining. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to such a wide group of scholars from all over the world. I felt most welcome. Thank you. Thank you.